Good morning to one and all. Uh, I esteem guests, uh, the speakers for the day are also here. Uh, Ajaya Jaitliji, uh, Mayank Pansinkol, and Sanjay Garg, uh, all three small watches in textile field here. Um, and warm greetings on national handbook on behalf of uh, NIFT Bengaluru. Uh, it wasn't just to give this a context, uh, it was in 2015 that the Honorable Prime Minister had declared the very first uh, National uh, Handloom Day on August the 7th. So as to commemorate uh, the Swadeshi movement during the Indian independence struggle. And at NIFT, uh, we celebrate this day with great, great uh, fervor. Uh, you know, this is the second time that we have had to celebrate this online. Last year, we had had uh, as well. Uh, but this year, uh, we have scaled it up to uh, the very first edition of the Guru Loom Festival. We call it in sh uh, short. We have lined up for you seven online uh, panel discussions over today and uh, tomorrow. We bring across the brightest minds who are working on textiles across fields of government, sector, uh, design practitioners, historians, authors, aficionados, social media influencers, uh, online marketplace giants, uh, so on and so forth. So I hope you will be able to participate. Uh, and engage in this discussion over these uh, an inaugural session uh, with these three uh, who've taken Indian textiles, who've studied Indian textiles in depth. Uh, Jaya JPG needs no no introduction. Uh, she is founder and president of Satsakari Heart Samadhi. Uh, her books are the Bibles on which we have grown up and we have uh, kindled our interest on. Billy Hart has always been, uh, you know, a favorite memory and a favorite haunt uh, for a, a lot of us, and that also we owe to the organizational skill of uh, JRG. Um, and uh, moving over to Mayank uh, Mansingkol, uh, Mayank is an author and he's an independent activist and writer as well. Uh, Sanjay Garg uh, needs no introduction again. Uh, a proud Nifian uh, and uh, designer and owner of the label uh, Raw Mango. Uh, Sanjay has given uh, mangoes, uh, you know, a complete new meaning in, in the Indian context uh, again. I mean, his sari is a true and you know, adorned by the who's who of uh, India and abroad. And it's such a pleasure uh, to talk to three uh, people. So, uh, you know, the, the topic of the panel today is has handcraft, and I mean both craft as well as loom negotiated India's history and where do we go from here? Uh, we picked this topic uh, particularly for the inaugural session because we felt that the narrative was just not moving away uh, in the past 70, 75 years uh, from uh, you know, acting as the messiah for the weaver to a more uh, nuanced approach where the weaver has more agency and uh, wherein we look at it in a more robust uh, manner. So Jayaji, I start with you, uh, since you've written extensively on both handcraft and loom. Uh, has handcraft and has handloom uh, the identity of uh, India historically? What is your take on that? I wish it had. Um, I think the history, you said now identity, but the history of India Handloom and handicraft is not shaped it. I think it's the other way around. Handicraft, the history has buffeted handloom and handicraft. And long, long ago, one can look back to the Vijayanagar Empire and say that they were really powerful, the weavers were. But so many, and even when the Mughals came, uh, they at least appreciated the arts and they enriched the craft, certainly. Uh, in weaving, they, of course, they added to the carpets industry, industry, they were really ateliers or karkhanas. Uh, but I think the British made quite certain that we were pretty much wiped out in Handu. And craft for them, as long as craft was uh, either good for the grand exhibition that they had at Earl's Court, then of course the best of craft and they wanted to show it in their, their prized possessions and treasures because that was their colony. But the little ones, like the potters and all, they didn't even waste their energy kicking them to the ground because they were local production for local people, local surai for water drinking. It was very low grade commoner who did not uh, affect their trade and business. So I think the survival that happened 
was pretty much a little before Gandhi, perhaps, but well, Gandhi became conscious of it before uh, independence. But uh, with we are celebrating this Amrit Mahotsav, then uh, yesterday, in fact, when in Mumbai, I connected the history of handicraft and handloom with Amrit Mahotsav, 75 years of it, where it was and where it's come. I think we should be happy now. We are trying to give it agency. Many, many of us in different ways. As we get out of this colonized mode, it's a conscious movement at decolonization in all our minds, at least all of us sitting here. And we're trying to share the value of crafts and handloom. And I think it is catching on. There are many world events like climate change and all that will help us. So I think it's time for us to help in creating an identity more strong. But I wouldn't say that uh, they did anything for many years. Right. Mike, uh, would you like to come in uh, at, at this point? Um, sure. Thank you, Susan, uh, firstly, for having us. It's so nice to connect with you. And it's so nice to reconnect with you, Jaya, Jaya Ji and Sanjay. Uh, I learned so much from you uh, over the years. So it's really nice to be able to um, participate in this. Um, well, I mean, has, uh, you know, I think that from where I, uh, from, from my practice, which is from the perspective of research in historical and contemporary histories, as well as as a curator, really uh, does come across, I mean, is that all the world came to India historically for textiles. And it was really a very important um, center for production and design, as well as export of handmade textiles. Um, however, uh, in context, we, we have a lot of emphasis on, you know, these kinds of narratives about the wispy uh, wind or air like Jamdani from Bengal and the muslin from the Deccan and so on and so forth. Uh, which has captured definitely to a large extent India's, the imagination of India in a historical period because it what drew colonial powers uh, for the profit of trade in the first place from whatever has been studied and recorded. But we actually have very little physical evidence of it. So there are a lot of literary evidences. There's a lot of um, uh, stuff like this mentioned in literature. But a bulk of our historical material that we actually can rely on to study and to make these are kind of arguments really come from largely from the 19th century onwards. So before that, um, we have, you know, between, between the 15th, 16th century till, till the 19th century, we have collections of Indian textiles, trade textiles, hand painted. Jayaji mentioned, of course, the exquisite. Uh, brocades that were commissioned and are known to have been made in Mughal ateliers, in the Deccan, in the courts across the country. So there's a, this kind of lacuna. Uh, there is this idea of India, indigo, muslin, and so on and so forth that becomes the bedrock of a, a pattern kind of wealth that India generates for almost two millennia. But the lack of real evidence is of what kind of text has generated the wealth. So in that sense, somewhere this preoccupation has been about textiles from India being a luxury item, but actually a lot of the physical evidence that we found, whether it's in Southeast Asia, among the largest early references we have from about the 14th, 15th century called the famous Fostat remains, the Indo-African textile fragments that were found in Africa. They actually indicate so much of Indian textile was actually going as base cloth around the world. So there's also that identity, perhaps, which hasn't been sufficiently sort of studied. The idea of Indian handmade, what you call artisanal today product, being a base for a substantial amount of cotton clothing and apparel history in the world. So somewhere I think that, you know, the, the idea of Indian textiles has kind of captured you know, a lot of this space in historical studies, which is, I suppose, the purview of your question. But we really don't understand what, what exactly, or we don't fully understand what was this handloom from India that actually was creating this buzz around the world. Yes. So that's a big lacuna. And in that absence, I think we have to be, we have to be careful in over assumptions of, 
of therefore India's you know handloom tradition in a historical point of view. From the contemporary point of view, I mean, there's a great awareness around the world today and largely in the last 70 years that India is a great base for production of any variety of Indian textile. But, it, but has that given it um, its due identity? I will have to agree with elements of, of designs around the world, but we haven't really shaped that identity or, uh, at a conceptual level, at the level of design. And from that point of view, we're, we're, we're far back compared to other countries and other um, hand production ecologies like Japan that have been able to, for instance, really foreground the way they produce by hand, or France that has developed so much of private and public infrastructure around it. So somewhere I think that that meaning has has been different in the Indian context. Okay. So, uh, in fact, I mean, the question that I had framed was in the context that, uh, I mean, no, not only the material evidence, I mean, you know, you brought in Fusat uh, into the conversation, material evidence uh, that has been brought in, but this was, this being a great transactor of trade over centuries, yes, sure. uh, has brought in people from across the world to the country. And then, of course, the entire shebang of colonialism, uh, edifice on which the movement uh, in itself I was eventually it, yes. built on was about how it was uh, devastating the countryside and two main pillars of it was agriculture and weaving. Yeah. I would like to come in here, you know, I absolutely yeah. understand that. Uh, but we can always question what that was the visual identity where what we, what we wear, it shows a, a certain kind of a communication. I had a long hair or a short hair. I'm a man. So I don't know there was a toga. Sorry, there's some disturbance. I think uh, there's a... Sanjay, you've been muted. Uh, Sanjay, are you on mute? Yeah, yeah, sir. So I said I would like to explore that I don't have any historical evidence of it that the sari, the toga was inspired from sari, or toga was inspired from this. We have yes. many examples, say tie and dye, ikat, or uh, batik, whether they have gone from here or from the silk route or, or vice versa. I would right. love to study that. As, as Mang said, we don't have those historical events, but all I know, today we're calling it a handloom day only because of past 90 or 100 years, we could also celebrate, celebrate maybe a textile day. So there is a division here, but that division didn't exist before because the only medium was to produce things by hand. So there was no machine. So they didn't really look at it because it was made by hand only that wasn't important enough. I think they saw an importance in the world because the rest of it was they could not produce. So I think it was more of a design, a quality, a material, uh, uh, a certain uh, visual identity or technique which they didn't have or a color or a dye. I think that was an uh, importance point, but not, I would say, sympathy or, you know, they buy because hand loom or someone made it for them. That was the reason. It's that, that they couldn't produce. And I think we have enough evidence of that spices and textile worth of the world. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, um, somehow I think you know, uh, Jayaji talked about the industrial exhibitions where, you know, most of these lovely arts and crafts were showcased. And Mayank also touched on uh, luxury you know, items, especially in the Mughal years and things like that. And Sanjay, you talk about saris. And probably this is a good time to sink into what I call that, you know, how has India been able to capture this market of, I mean, or will India be able to capture this market of luxury fashion? Uh, you know, can India pitch its handloom and handicraft uh, in that uh, uh, segment of luxury fashion because it's slow craft, it's handmade uh, craft. And since you talked about machines and, you know, uh, something that they could not produce. Um, and Mayank also talked about the romanticism of, uh, you know, the wispy, airy, um, uh, you know, the, the, the mist, the dew, all those uh, terms. Uh, you know, is it time for us to leap, to take the next leap of faith uh, into the luxury segment? Can we pitch uh, ourselves onto that luxury fashion segment? Well, why not? But I think luxury demands, I mean, honestly, we really need to understand also we have a lot to address when it comes to handloom. 
Not right. every produce things by hand loom is definitely a great of a quality. I think we need to see where do we want to stand today. There are many many to it. We can just discuss this in a long topic. When you see a weaver, if you think from that point of view, why does weaver son only become a weaver, and why does weaver son also not get paid as a doctor or engineer? So you can say, oh, if he's supposed to get paid, that and loom certainly person garments, then he cannot buy any more for hundred thousand rupees. To not to do so, then you have to make a kind of a mass production, and then mass production. Um, India lives in too many different kind of India in one country. We, we are not like a Sweden and Finland, where most of the population is on a some sort of a same level. You know, we have people who are making ten thousand to fifteen thousand, richest the people, the poorest the people, the biggest middle class lives in this country. So right. We have to see a that what does luxury means to us, to them, and the luxury need to go through a. Uh, for many, many different points of view. Honestly, I'm sorry to say that this is it's beautiful. I mean, handloom is great, but we really need to think hard today. Do you think, we, are we like top of the world that in terms of innovation in design or technique and things like that, we really have to ask ourselves. And A, then who is the consumer? Is the world is the consumer or our own people? Uh, what is our importance? Our importance is someone is, to sell something in Tokyo or 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 London or or uh, or Copenhagen, or I would like to sell it in Nagpur, Lucknow, or Kanpur. Uh, so, what is that clientele, and what does luxury mean to two different people? So, but it's uh, Sanjay. I would like to come in here, Sanjay. Where do the best of the chickens go? We never get to see them in India. Chicken curry. Yeah. No. I mean, I mean, like well, uh, well, honestly. <laughs> it's not to say. So when, if you really study chicken, chicken curry, when I also got very old samples, I realized the chicken wa curry wasn't supposed to be, first of all, worn all over. Two. Firstly, firstly, we have to we have to understand that a lot of our present preoccupations mm -hmm. and our ideas about what is luxury in the context that we're discussing is, is, framed, is framed by a certain. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. So yeah, I think we have to first establish that when we talk about luxury, I think a lot of our ideas about the way luxury is created, sold, marketed, written about, comes from a West-centric idea of how certain kinds of luxury experiences. Now, within that, um, do Indian handlooms have a role right now? They don't play a role. Uh, when I talk about handlooms, I'm talking about specifically hand-woven traditions, they have a very marginal role to play. But yes, handcrafted Indian textiles have a huge role to play because all the embroideries that you see, you know, almost all the embroideries that you see around the world are made in India. They are then sent and assembled in these ateliers of luxury houses internationally. So uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of handmade textiles go to Southeast Asia, to, to Japan. There's a huge market there. So we're already participating in the luxury um, segment in a way, but like I said earlier, as kind of producers. Uh, we've had, the third point is we've had very few instances of those kinds of luxury uh, entries from India in terms of brands. So there was a great iconic, you know, uh, collaboration between Asha Sarabhai in the 80s. You have Varana, which is a Bangalore-based brand today, which has opened a store in London. So you have a few examples of Indian brands trying to enter into that luxury space. But I think it's also equally important for us to... So just to help you understand that these occurrences exist. 
However, for us to really participate in the luxury space, and I don't mean in the international luxury market, I think we have to, which, which means through curatorial work, through conversations, through publications, we have to be able to um, also articulate, like Sanjay said, what luxury means to us. Yeah. And I think that that idea of what is Indian luxury, what is the kind of luxury that, you know, India intrinsically believes in, what is our idea of it? Is it a product of cost? Is it a product of materials? Is it a product of rare experiences? What is, what is that idea of luxury? So somewhere I think that, you know, it's, it's too easy. If you look at, you look at internet communication today, a brand that's selling something for 10,000 is appears as luxury. Whereas somebody that's selling something for 10 lakhs is luxury as well. Yeah. So I think these conversations need to be happen, uh, to happen more. I don't think that there is a single answer. Yeah. Yeah. But before we can actually have that conversation about Indian production and Indian making and creativity and design and yeah. the Western predominance in articulating luxury, yeah. I don't think we can really move forward in, in really being able to therefore assess whether it's been successful or not. Yeah, so, you know, the, the point from which I was trying to come in was, uh, you know, slightly shifting uh, uh, the focus away from local consumption uh, and also whether the policy space can look at pitching handlooms, uh, you know, handlooms and handcraft as luxury. I mean, you know, even in, um, let, let us say, an 18th century uh, Europe, I mean, the ideas of luxury were defined by uh, pashminas and, you know, um, yes. fine jewels that went from here and things like that. And Jayaji, you have worked extensively with governments, with organizations. Uh, do you, uh, and, and this question comes specifically to you that have we been stuck at one place as far as policy on handlooms is concerned? Or have we uh, forgotten to sort of reinvent ourselves? Um, you know, because, you know, we talked about the colonial uh, experience and things like that. So we, we are still in that lamenting over romanticized mode. Are we ready to take on a more provocative, more challenging role uh, for Indian handlooms? I haven't seen any government anywhere in the world um, really promoting their luxury handlooms as such. This is usually done in the private sector, and I think this is the only way it can really work in India. The private sector works with people there who want limited editions, who want a, a real luxury item abroad will mean a very fine fabric, very fine workmanship. That takes time. Time yeah. costs money. Yeah. So all these things matter a lot when you term something as luxury. Yeah. I don't think government has time to fiddle with 20 excellent weavers for 20 excellent customers. They want lakhs and many lakhs of people to serve and to have the handloom weavers at least get two meals a day and have a smile on their face. I think that's what government sees as their job and perhaps that's all we actually need to expect. And in that, as I've been promoting today for Handloom Day, what's this Handloom Day? It's like Women's Day or any other day. Why only one day everybody goes, hi, Toba, lovely, lovely, and then you forget, and then you, you know, beat your wife or whatever the next day, and you go back to your synthetic trousers bought in, on, in Harrods or something the next day. All that is all bunk. And I have a, uh, in that way, I have a very political ideology view about terming luxury. What is luxury? If you look at the huge market that is in India, luxury for a poor person means buying an expensive, expensive, not necessarily very fine or tasteful, for a wedding or something like that. It's the occasion that makes something a luxury item in India. So uh, I'm glad you differentiated between the foreign market and in India, but we have a, we have a different concept, I think, of luxury in India and we should have a different concept for the West or whichever country. And I think really the West, those who are buyers, art collectors, buyers, owners of very fancy stores, or making custom you know, one-off pieces, they come and look for us. And it's interesting, they find very unknown weavers whom we also have not really come across and worked with much. And they work with them and they create beautiful things. We go and see them in windows abroad and we say, gosh, this is lovely, Indian. And yes, it's Indian. So um, 
we shouldn't get too tangled in what the word luxury means. I absolutely agree. And also, we shouldn't be worried that what do have their luxury. You know, what all, I mean, the definition, of, we have to, it's kind of, we have our own problem and our own solution. As our problems are unique, the solution is going to be unique too. That's how I always thought. It has to be localized method of solving and thinking, you know. I don't think that we need to, I mean, I, I don't think so. Their point of view, if I do believe in my point of view, it's not about right and wrong. But I think there are two different things. Right. Um, so there's been a bit of a glitch on my uh, this thing. So uh, there is no, I hope I'm audible uh, to the speakers. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, Sanjay, when you talked about uh, that, you know, when we were answering the first question, Sanjay, you talked about machines and, you know, uh, you know, that entire dichotomy between what a machine can produce and hands can produce. I'm going to take you on uh, a bit on that. Uh, in our narrative on handloom, do we always see a dichotomy between, uh, you know, machine and uh, you know, handcraft, so to speak. I say this because uh, there has been, uh, you know, very, very uh, nuanced research uh, on economic history and uh, things which have come out now from London School of Economics and others, wherein they show that, uh, you know, the Dobby, the Jacquard, uh, the introduction of synthetic dyes, et cetera, have actually aided um, handloom weaving or have actually aided clusters across uh, India, and which is also one of the reasons why we've been able to survive and reinvent ourselves over the years. So, um, so Sanjay, uh, where do you see this dichotomy coming very, in from? Very interesting. First of all, uh, the loom in itself is a machine, is yantra. Yeah. It's yantra. So you're not weaving with your fingers, on fingers. You are using a, a machine, a mechanism, and if you really divide the world before electricity and after electricity, actually the only difference is, in a way, I'm just saying the uh, just the uh, uh, weaving on the loom. I'm mean, there are other than like you also spin the uh, thread or you tie and dye. There are many many different things handicraft. But if you see as it is a, a loom which is driven by uh, uh, electricity and one is not. So A, that we already using machine. The machine is not a human enemy. It's nothing bad about it. I think we need both in the world. And I do understand, and I've been saying that it is nothing is very constant. It's kind of a language where a house has died because they didn't adopt new words and English keep adopting few words every year. I think that handloom also need to be aware of it. And I think we need to move with the time. What time is that we can all decide. But I think it needs changes. We need to go through changes by time or, or the way we live in. Someone live in a flat. How many times you wear it? Are you working in the metro? Many, many things. There's a working woman. When are, when are they wearing and why are we wearing and what are the habits? What is that that today you know, is going to change about the handloom? So I don't think so that handloom could produce or or I would like to see that luxury means to which is only produced by loom or hand loom or anything. I think they both have their own place because India has such a huge market and when the hand loom wasn't in trend less than last three decades, a lot of people, I think most of the people had same design detail and synthetic yarns and sadly machine. So I think crafting really die when we were back and we are interest aware, like we are again waken up and we wanted to go for handloom again, at least it didn't die. The strand didn't break. So it was frozen somewhere with help of a machine. The prices come down to like a 2000 rupees for a sari and someone was consuming it. Man. Uh, so, I mean, let me respond um, in two ways. Firstly, you know, for, you know, we have this term brocade, right, in handlooms, which is technically it's the act of patterning using a jala or a jacquard or, or a harness mechanism. Yeah. Now, we see the emergence of this historically about a thousand years back. And that can be seen as the first industrial revolution because it is actually introducing a way of producing 
patterned woven textiles faster than what existed, which was complementary weaving. So, you know, for about a thousand years, the first millennium is predominant around the world with the technique of complementary weaving, where you're weaving along with patterning. And then for about a thousand years in the second millennium, you have the predominance of supplementary vector brocading using jacquard, uh, jala, like I said. So in that sense, a lot of, you know, technology has moved to faster itself, right? The pace of production, it allows for a scale of production. It has enabled then the trade of these textiles around the world and so on and so forth. So I feel that mechanization in the world today is inevitable. I feel so, is it in the Indian context? And I, I, I completely agree with Sanjay when he says that both have to coexist. But I also feel that the machines, if the machine can produce something that the hand can produce equally well or better, then I don't think the hand should produce it. Absolutely. I think I think the hand should be able to produce something that the machine cannot replicate. Absolutely. And I feel one of the issues with this whole hand loop versus mechanized kind of conversation, of course, the moral sort of compasses which we inherit in India to look at hand loom and its 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 vitality and relevance in providing livelihood, loses the perspective that uh, unless we focus on excellence in hand making. You know, I don't think handlooms have the same kind of future because if we don't focus on that excellence that the hand can use, machine is going to reproduce it. Sooner or later, you have machines in Italy which have 15 years back, I've seen them myself, which, which can reproduce Jamdani. You have embroidery machines in China that can produce, uh, you know, what, what people are doing in Kutch. So I think there is a level of being for the machine to reiterate, to be able to reproduce something that the hand does, it's going to happen sooner than later, if it's not happening already. So I think that we have to, I really am of the belief that unless we really invest in the hand producing what the machine cannot, that's really where our innovation needs to lie. And unless the handloom sector, the hand craftsmanship sector can focus on that, this is, is going to be inevitable. This is really my argument. The other aspect is also the, I mean, the other aspect that I've observed, and of course, Jayaji may have more perspective, will certainly have more perspective than me, because she travels the sector wider and, and more, more than me. But I feel that there are also, we cannot in a discussion like this discount that hand producers across the country largely are at the lowest level in social hierarchies where they are. So, so the need to kind of produce machines and all of these things I have also palpably felt is coming from other requirements of other needs to modernize and to see themselves as modern, as makers as well. And in the same way that we don't expect a doctor's son to become a doctor and a lawyer's son to become a lawyer's son, I think that for them to have that agency to be able to choose those professions and say, you know, to leave. But if, if stay, then modernize according to them is something that we can't take that prerogative away from, from the producers because hand production, you know, hand producers are, are at the lowest level of, uh, of the social and, and caste and class hierarchies in the country. So that's also a dimension that in In the, in the production centers and in the attitude. Yeah. So I'll add my two bits to this. Um, the thing is that whenever we talk about machines and their inevitability, I know that's true and it has to be to see the validity of our looms existing alongside hand loom and not say, you know, kind of get, become aggressive against power loom um, but the thing is that who then owns that machine is a very important thing again a bit of a political question but can we allow our weavers and I've seen some weavers investing in power looms they have hand loom as well as power loom 
And their very simple argument is, yes, I am handloom for the group and pay for it. But for those, when I can make five sarees a day instead of one in five days, I will certainly find it cheaper and I will get more customers who want it. So his logic is so practical and correct that you can't say anything about it. And I would like to bring in here the whole, why do we always out of handloom leave out khati? That's as much handloom. Just because it's man fun, it shouldn't be on a separate sacred pedestal all the time because then Kadi gets this same thing. You do that one day and then nobody wants it the next day because it's either shabbily done or it's too expensive or you look like a politician or some silly thing like that. And what happened, we're talking about machine, so many tourists didn't want to number check which will help us speed up process in production. So we're very confused in our arguments. And I think the also ministries divided between Kadi and handloom and textile is very confusing. And we should be clear ourselves which path of development. And then the government should also say, and we should be willing to say we want to join. And the private sector can come in where it can, and the other government comes in somewhere else. Cluster programs that just want to give training and give employment and do some brain skills on a full cloth because you can always embellishment. This embellishment. It has been remuneration for the weaver. We're talking about mechanization. Uh, unless we make sure that the weaver gets a loan, at least to buy a part of it is is not fair. And it's a little short-sighted in only in one day. May I just add something, Susan, if I may? You know, I, I'm reminded, Jayaji, of the last time we met, which was about two or three years back, you were talking about how, you know, there are, when we talk about handlooms, we have to understand that, that there are about 12 or 16 processes that accompany the weaving process or pre and post loom. So I think in this, you know, I want to draw inside that, you know, so I mean, in, in a place like Ponduru, you even have the, the cotton, which is processed by hand, which, which is a part of this handloom product. So at what point do you, you know, legitimize and recognize the mechanization of certain pre-loom or post-loom processes? For so long, Banaras used to send artists to Bhagalpur for burnishing which is, you know, beating so that you can burnish because Banaras conventionally was a largely metallic surface. So at what point do you, you know, so in that sense, often I remember Jayaji saying that often the weaver is actually doing the most mechanical of things in the, in the handloom process. And the artisanal processes actually are in the pre-weaving and often post-loom processes. Cool. So that's an interesting, I mean, what, what you just also kind of put, put back into that conversation that at what point, point do we legitimize certain things as being okay for semi-mechanization, for mechanization? And I think another thing that you had drawn attention um, earlier to me, which, which is that, you know, you have in India, we're, we're not in a binary of just hand production and just mechanized production. And most of our production is actually lies somewhere in the middle. So you have yarn being produced in the mill, but being handwoven. You have dyeing, which may be done in, in a machine, but, you know, hand tied for e -cut. So I think somewhere the, the kind of Indian ecology kind of is, is um, very complex in accommodating a range of hand, semi, handmade, yeah. mecha mechanized processes. You have assemblage in many cases. You have the, the components of a handloom being made on a machine, but the weaving is done by hand. So I think it, it's a complex, it's a complex kind of set of production realities. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Mike, that you know it is uh, you know a far more yeah. complex. Yeah, Sanjay. I was I was just in Andhra for last week, and I saw beautifully weaving happening. And as Mike rightly said. You know, whenever they were taking to me the loom, it's like, oh, they're doing plain weave. I mean, I don't want to see it. I know what plain weaves are. I said, I want to see the banda, the way the band, the tie, the calculation. He so rightly said, because that's one of the most mechanized job. I mean, I know and I'm aware of it. There are some adobes and jacquard and some patterns are added. 
and the jari are in the body and somewhere with the mix of ikat but mainly ikat is a plain weave and it's the whole work exists somewhere else to so the dyer and the person who the mathematician actually tying the yarn according to the engineer motif in a warp and weft pattern so, very interesting yeah notice that i just wanted to make that point yeah sure so uh, you know uh, so the you know what mayank said about this being a complex process and bringing in uh, nuances and i think that's where probably i mean you know days and discussions uh, are important jay ajay uh, you know uh, slightly differing from what you said uh, because for a lot of us uh, you know on a handloom day we think that it is ethnic wear or is it is i mean a traditional wear day i mean not even ethnic wear but a traditional wear day uh we forget the nuance of where, whether it is a hand woven uh you know cloth um or, or not um and having said that when when you talk about khadi and you know um, how the kvic act has been successively modified and there was at one point of time a talk of even a polyester khadi for heaven say uh so uh, you know the the mandate uh, that i had thought for this panel of also since you come from different fields of you know uh, design practice and you know uh, ma'am having worked with uh, policy space as well and mine being an independent writer uh, is there a necessity to let go of the romanticization of handlooms which is largely been defined by our uh, anti colonial narrative and in that i say that i mean you know um, i i go back to that uh entire economic argument of how the village economy was uh, destabilized and how uh, weaving and you know uh, agriculture which were alternate occupations in most of these villages do we need to go away do we need to shed that baggage and uh, go away in policy space uh, uh, for handlooms whether in terms of marketing whether in terms of entering into online spaces uh, whether the state itself can enter into that space mayank i don't personally i have never i have never believed that the indian government um has the capability to be involved in all you know aspects of marketing product development i think at best it can play as jaya joy uh, jaya ji earlier pointed out it can play the role of a facilitator i feel that the i feel that the indian government should really uh I, i think a lot of this mandate has to be carried by the private sector and they will have a facilitating role so yes if there are regions where there are human rights violation the government does have a role i feel in being able to make sure that um you know certain kinds of legalities minimum wage requirements protection of workers craft people i think these are the areas which i think that the government certainly needs to play a role in protecting the interest of 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 a professional class like it would any other professional class and therefore to be to be able to intervene and have proactive mechanisms to be able to protect and and preserve these interests i don't personally think that the government has a role in marketing i don't think that it has a role in in product development Uh, I don't think it has. Um, I, I really, really strongly believe that it does. Uh, uh, I would like to add one point, sir. As what man saying, what government can do? Say, I would. You know, for the family, that we need a very, a uh, very equal, uh, a slab or a yarn for the wall, which doesn't break very easily when you weave as a wall. Weft can have very much of slab, but warp should not have it. it just make a, a loom or to weaver much easier and you know that i think 80% of that silk is we are importing from china so my question is that and china is deciding factor for the price of the silk so i would like to see that how can a research and development i am not saying you give us in free i am not saying any of it all i'm trying to see you think if they could produce a better cocoon in a better temperature it's like a green revolution or farming so how can we have a better cotton i am not even saying that you give us all i'm trying to say can we do that research and development to get us the best the fiber depending again are we have a local problem there has to be local solution we cannot pick up on china what did to produce that best the silk or the cotton like what rajasthan if is they making dari to or case or 
or a khadi or urmul what cotton we can grow because we did grow that and what can tamil nadu or bangalore can do so i think there there could be a very big role other than that i also see that i do not have a problem i mean i do have a problem i do not like but if someone wants to say a printed ikat i want to wear but is not ikat i do have a problem i said but i don't think so we can say legally if it says is printed ikat is not made it's fine but i think 80% things are made and sold on let's say is ikat but is not ikat or chanderi which is not ikat you know banaras which is not in uh, made in varanasi there is a airy silk which is not airy the quality of the content of khadi which is not hand spun just hand woven or just the warp is hand spun but the weft is not again there are a lot of the small small things yeah you know? and i just want to say about the romanticizing of the handloom i always thought you know everyone think of us oh my great grandma love the handloom and she had that many sari i don't know whether uh, they liked handloom i think they didn't have any other mean there was no other mean to produce a sari that time you know machine didn't even exist the only medium was to produce things were hand suppose they did like they i didn't think so they had an option to choose between them i think i would want to say very categorically i do remember when then they was given option of terry coat came in or the rayon came in they completely jumped over it and people loved it so i think we need to really look at it what it like uh, they didn't really like those because of only so much more much more than to it i think that was the only medium where you could produce sarees and that's the reason they they not everyone liked it because it was made by hand that's it yeah ji can you unmute yourself uh... Yeah, you know, it gets muted on its own. Um, today, I read a very sweet piece of news, which said the Kashmir silk factory is going to be revived again. Okay. I lived in Kashmir for twenty-five years, and I loved that little factory down a lane yeah. near the, one of the nalas. And you had a very special Kashmiri silk sari they used to produce, which was just very fine checks, which were woven in in white, and the silk itself used to be usually a range of pastels all the kashmiri pandit grandmas everybody used to wear those and they were so typical of kashmir and then they vanished yeah it wasn't it like non twisted yarn like just a flat like a flat yarn and the the texture of that is very different the texture is formed by the checks which That's is a pattern maybe i'm just saying at the surface when you touch it surface when you touch it you feel the checks separately it doesn't incorporate with the weave it's it separately works well, I, i think they use a very different kind of silk which is maybe yeah. twisted yarn yeah. silk but fine that's what i was getting at yeah. they grew they grew beautiful mulberry uh, in silk in kashmir the cocoons all that got destroyed with militancy if it's going to be revived again i think many people ought to welcome this and even you know and i was worried because when i was leaving kashmir finally uh in the 90s they started sending plain silk to print to uh, other printing centers which were very shabby unesthetic no identity to it at all and that should not happen again could they uh, it should become a pure kashmiri thing and i think lots of designers should help in that because that's a wonderful opportunity but what i would like to say the getting back and just putting a little final word into the romantic and all of that is that handloom when every grandma used to wear it what did people like me like about it who's very today and also a grandma is that the aesthetic was beautiful there was a very fine aesthetic indianness which was not gaudy which was not glitchy and it it gave uh, it gave you the identity to the place like the fine temple odisha borders or the kerala kasava mundu or anything like that that identity was something that resonates with all of us who feel maybe you want to call it romantic about it if that were be, if if that were to be produced in powerloom totally i would say i'm perfectly happy with it as long as the powerlooms were in the hands of those handloom weavers for me that's the final attitude 
if things have to change, let it change fairly and in, in an egalitarian way. And if we want to talk about Indian textile, it must not lose its traditional, and traditional here using the word as aesthetic yeah. uh, beauty, yeah. because that is what makes us different. So I'd like to, uh, if I may come in, Susan, just this, this idea of the romanticism that yeah. Sanjay brought up. I think there are two things. One is, so, so for me, this idea of, you know, looking at, you know, Indian handlooms as being produced in these idyllic rural landscapes yeah. that you enjoy viscerally or aesthetically, you assume that the producer is therefore accessing a good quality of life is a kind of romanticism that I, I have a problem with because yeah. it discounts the hardship, the problems that the producer faces. So there's a kind of external gaze to this production idea of the handlooms, which, which certainly I would qualify as a very prob problematic romanticism romanticization. But there's also a space which has, I think, in some ways contributed to the relevance in the mind space of, of for handlooms, which is, right. which is a romanticization of, of, of um, you know, which exists in, you know, in all, in all fields, whether it's literature, whether it's, you know, there's this idea of the past, which always appears yeah. more beautiful. I mean, my, you know, Jayajim was talking about Kashmiri, my grandmother was Kashmiri. And she used to tell us that when she, 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 she grew up in Lahore and she said that when it was very, very cold and there was a lot of snow, they could cycle to college because they wore those beautiful Pashmina sarees and they just had to wear one Pashmina sari. Um, and, you know, so for me, that idea is obviously is, is romantic at another level because it is about, it is about a kind of, you know, daily way of life, considering that today a Pashmina for me maybe something that I wear only on a special occasion or at a wedding, right? So there's also that, that idea of, of the other idea of receiving these, these stories through personal anecdotes and histories, which personally I find appealing because I think that there is an idea inherent about the kind of things that we've commodified, that we've put in museums, that we've, you know, that we've singularly, um, um, kind of received as luxury products. There's an the idea of all of these things being part of an everyday life, you know? And to me, that idea is, is appealing, even if it, it is romantic in another way. You know? And Monica. I feel it has contributed to, to keeping the idea of, of, of luxury in handlooms at a certain kind of level. Yeah, surely. Uh, Jayaji, but you know, you, you have worked with Gujri and you know, you have worked with the uh, government at various levels. I mean, in fact, that part of the aspect, uh, I would really like you to dwell uh, um, on a little bit about that, especially in the context where it's been a year uh, since, you know, the All India Handloom Board has also been abolished and there was a huge outcry. Uh, nobody knew what it was doing uh, as far as the general layman was concerned. But once it was abolished, I mean, you know, there was so much of outcry and, you know, there was so much of a sinister uh, agenda being perceived and all that stuff. Uh, you know, I would want you to come in uh, at this point uh, to pick on that. Well, we shouldn't take that abolishing very seriously because quite honestly, everybody who shouted, sometimes they were put on the board and chucked off the board without them even knowing it, one of them being me. So <laughs> it was a meaningless body which went on for far too long doing absolutely nothing except being one day talk and Sarkari Khana. So there was no point and I'm glad rubbish goes away. Uh, there's no point in refurbishing something that need be done by other people, not just like a sinecure to people who want to feel important. Yes. So, so that being said, Gurjari was a wonderful experiment and complete contrast to what we expect government to do. And I think that happened in a different time before bureaucratic, the system, the bureaucrats were paid so much that they thought that they knew better than the corporates. Yeah. And they therefore didn't want advice from us. Uh, that was the attitude that finally made them throw me out of good degree after 11 years ago, although I brought them all the success that they had. But anyway, the, in the beginning, um, the, the Gujarat government thought that it was, a, it was an organization that should have been closed up. So a policeman, who was more interested in Kathak and handicrafts said, no, no, please give me a chance. Let me get out of the police and do this, Mr. Basin. So he built it up and I wrote to him, I'd come from Kashmir and I said, look, if you got a job, I would love to work. He said, if you work for us, we'll create a job. 
for you. So that's how it happened. And I was made marketing and design consultant, not given any format, any nothing. I had to create my own path from chopping down uh, whatever was on the way. But it was such a wonderful thing because we were given a free hand. And can you imagine today people in government, going in a government van with government driver and staff, and I would see women wearing beautifully colored dupattas, a whole community of them because that was their community signature, you can say. I used to chase after them, drive after them, stop them and say, dupatta kaha ban ka and all, and they would tell me, and we would go there to the source of the whole thing, reproduce them on tie-dye saris and various other things. We would find a beautiful embroidery, have to explain to them, okay, take this off your complicated bodice. In the cities they wear, they have table mats. Can we put four corners of this booty into four table mats? Very silly designing, but it was it it linked the rural with the urban. I had to explain to Teji Bachan, Namita Bachan's mother why there were patches in the hand block printing because the cloth was stretched out for drying in the middle of a pathway where these also walked. So it was a very interesting time awakening a rural area with the help and complete support of the government. And right. one of our main, uh, main um, points was, which I kind of very strictly laid down, any karigar coming to us with anything to be sold at the Emporium, never, never we should say, saying your stuff is not good. Yeah. We don't sell, not a good design, not a good quality. Our job is to get, sit with them, improve, make their stuff saleable, then right. create sales report, when did that go into the Emporium, how many sold, what are the customers saying, are they suggesting something different? And it, we created a system out of nothing. I never learned business, economics, not marketing, nothing in my life, nor did I learn design. But it all happened in which I learned so much. It was probably the most wonderful time. I'm going to call it, huh? I had a time. The Gujarat government at that time, I don't even remember what the politics of Gujarat was. It didn't affect us. So I would, uh, and at that time, all Gurjari was so successful, various other emporia started having consultants doing their windows better, having karigars come and sit, these kind of things. It all went down the drain when I think more of a corporate thinking, branding, that sort of stuff started. And I found that the emporiums weren't serving the craftspeople very much. Many officers, unless you paid them a bribe, would say, no, this ka kaam teek nahi reject. That's when I got annoyed and started creating Dilli Heart. As let that be an option for a karigar to come directly and sell his stuff, however they may be. The market will lift him rather than the official. Yeah. So, so that was the little bit of a history of the good days. Right. Uh, Sanjay, your two cents on it? On, on what, sorry? Uh, you know, on, on the uh, final question where I was wrapping up uh, about, you know, uh, the, the government and, uh, you know, what uh, JRG has also said. Well, in I, fact, uh, I did say that about, well, I, as a designer, I didn't expect a single penny. I think um, we do say, and they, I could have chosen uh, two different models when I had an yeah. option or an NGO or a business. Uh, I definitely went this way because... I wanted to, I don't know. I, I, do, I do respect what work has been done from Daskar and Hasamiti and Daskar and many angels. I'm not saying that, but they are, they are very few also, you know. They, of course, she has given me only first chance. I'm not saying that, that they're not have imported, but I think very few of them are doing great kind, great work. So I really wanted to go, you think they need support, but I want to go step back. Why do, are they, where they need support today. I really want them to be on the feet, you know. Like I did have a talk yesterday with the Sambaradri Foundation and there was the same so, uh, conversation that I do understand they need support by the Sarpa. This support won't survive for long. Oh, subsidies. Why do we even have and make them into this category where they think as an endangered species where they need that kind of care? I would like to thrive as a business. And that exactly takes me to your first question when you said our identity of Indian textile, it wasn't thriving because I knew because it was sheer business. It did make some sort of a ripple effect in the world of, of, of their 
their wearing habits, you know, they, they thought what they could wear from that part of the world, it is they can't produce. It was sheer economy and business and design and aesthetic in many ways. So I think what, I really think we need to have a, a model where they, I hope they don't need our support. Yes. Mine is really- uh, Sorry, Sanjay, I just want to respond to your part about, I, I, you know, I take your point about R&D very well um, in the sense that I, I do think that, I mean, in the past we've had, you know, before I move on, I mean, Certainly, you've, you've had examples of co-op techs in the past. You've had the Weaver Service Center functioning really well in the first few decades of India's independence. So you've, you've had this success, these successful models, which were certainly at a time state-enabled. And I don't think we can disagree. I mean, at some point, you know, the Central Cottage Emporia had stores yeah. in New York and yeah. Paris called Sona. It was marketing yeah. things at an international level. It was employing people. It had retail presence in very, very top you know, locality, retail localities of these big cities in the world. But I think that Sanjay, I think somewhere, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, in the same way that fashion designers at some point came and formed the Fashion Design Council of India, you know, uh, I think that R&D also, I mean, you need 20 designers like you to come together and say, we'll put a certain amount of our profits every year for R&D. So I, I also feel that that I, you know, the, the utilization of those kind of profits that private companies make in the field and often, uh, you know, they make huge profits as we are aware, whether they're directed towards exports or the domestic market. So I think we have to also facilitate those kinds of private intervention in, in the realm of say R&D where the, the industry needs to now come together. Yes, they need an office space. Yes, the government should be approached and saying you have an institutional area can you give us a subsidized space or can you give us a rent free space for 20 years? But unless we shift away from this fundamental idea that the government is my bap and is going to come and help us, I think we're not going to be able to, um, we're not going to be able. So in that sense, Jayaji's model of Dastakari, of, Dastak, of the Dilli heart was that it was government, in, it was government facilitated. Yeah. But yeah. it was not government run to the extent that, you know, all of these uh, that was original true. intention and, and we know it was a very successful model. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think we cannot underscore that. So, you know, I've seen in the private sector, the minute it comes to this kind of big investment, private companies and brands will run to the government and say, please give us money to support this R&D center. When these companies are fully capable of investing in that kind of R&D, both in-house or as an industry group. So somewhere I think that we can't totally rule, rule and that hasn't happened in the private sector, yeah. you know, so it's not just in the government, the private sector has failed the sector too, because it hasn't come together, leaving aside its own competitiveness, yeah. its own narrow mindedness and, and it hasn't created these avenues of research and development either, you know, so these are, these are things that, you know, I mean, why, why has the handloom mark not come from the private sector? It needs it more. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's very convenient for the private sector to go to the government when it needs big bucks because they know they have these funds at the end of the year to utilize or, or they know there's some and very convenient to kind of, uh, you know, not need the in other in, in other circumstances. I think somewhere the private sector has to step up far more than it is. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think, uh, you know, we'll open up uh, for questions. Three quick questions before we take into the uh, you know next panel i can already see that there has been a parallel discussion going on in the chat uh, but if there is anybody uh, who would like to uh, take a question uh, can you please raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask please don't ask cross questions uh, please take the specific panelist name and uh, shoot a specific question there are questions on the chat maybe you could read them out or something No? Perhaps because not everyone may be reading them. Yeah. Yeah. Susan, you choose from the chat. Is she listening? Susan, can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I, I think, I mean, you know, Mayank had also chipped in uh, to that question in between. So Ishwari had, uh, she's one of our students who had asked, uh, yeah, so Gayatri Ranga has asked a question. Uh, you know, she has asked, is the fair pay practice being followed by some foreign groups who establish a label in India? 
and use nomads or raw material produced by locals and get these raw materials um, or services at cheap prices. Is this not similar to poor Indians getting exploited? Does government have any policies and are the remote BPL lo locals being paid uh, correctly? Uh, well, I think it was addressed to me. Yeah. Uh, I'll answer this as best I can. She suddenly yes. brought in the nomad. So that means wool, camel wool and things like that. Yeah. I'm also on a board which is helping pastoralists and camel herders. Uh, selling their milk and also their wool. Now, when nothing was ever sold before, yeah. they are happy to sell, but you have to test the market before you can actually price something that was never sold before and only made for personal use. Uh, I have found also with the whole story or experience of Dilli Hart, once you let the Karigar test the market themselves, and they realize there's a good market, they will themselves raise their price. The Madhubani that used to be sold at 200 is now sold. Two thousand mads, which is back up beyond camel herders who don't even live a settled existence. Um, okay. To worry about fair trade for wool for that, I would say <clears throat> let the wool first be brought into the market, appreciated, sold, even locally. And if you're buying up the whole thing at a very basic reasonable price, certainly not exploitation because there are always agencies in between who look after the interests of the herders and nomads. Uh, then I, I think that's not a bad way to start. It's better than nothing. Fair trade is another very sophisticated thing where they, they go to organizations which are well settled, well uh, organized, whether they are NGO or otherwise. And uh, their situation in putting that into the nomad and herder is not quite right. It becomes apples and oranges. Yeah, you just wanted to add one thing here. Also, the middleman become a very bad word in between. Then I realized that as long as anyone adding some value to the product is nothing wrong in it. That's what we've been taught in my educational system that middleman is as some kind of an avillion in the whole story but i, I, I think today today e-commerce is a huge middleman yeah, yeah. they take yeah. huge profits which we don't even know hidden profits for storage space for of things so you know uh to, middleman may be a very old traditional word where you can hammer him with a juta but e-commerce is not an alternative for somebody who wants a fair price for their handmade goods uh, yes. Susan, if I may come in here, I just yeah. want to, uh, you know, I just want to draw attention to Dasakali Hat Samiti, which is the organization that Jayaji started. Yeah. I remember being in high school and, you know, interviewing her for our student newsletter. And it's never left me because she, the, you know, what she shared at that point, I mean, now what, 25 years back. The idea that Dasakali Hat Samiti as a member organization was formed. So that, you know, every, every Karigar who's a part of it pays a fee, an annual fee to be a part of it. Together, they're able to benefit. And the idea is that the minute there's a community that feels that they can access better representation for themselves and their issues through an organization like this, it joins them. So the idea is that, that somewhere these kinds of organizations and these facilitation platforms are important because... because you know, the minute the production, the producers feel that there's a, there's a way that they can represent themselves, there should be some way to do that. And I think that that's important, that that representation, and they may choose or not to choose to be outside of it or be a part of it. It's yeah. their prerogative, it's their choice. Right. But they will come into the fold if they feel that an organization like this, which is literally like an industry body. Yeah. I, mean, I just feel like we it's really disservice to not recognize these kinds of organizations at par with industry bodies like CII or FIKI, because that's really what they're doing. They're providing an opportunity for the, for producers to come together for better representation, you know, and yeah. unless that, that representation, you know, is, is, is recognized more, it's successful. We, we will not have a situation where the agencies of these changes that we, we expect in the field, are not coming from within, they have to come from within.
Yeah. Okay. So uh, there's one last question, uh, Raji Mauri. Uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, she's somebody who works with the clusters as well. Uh, she has a question uh, on GI tag and whether GI has actually helped the weavers. She writes, they are proud that their weaver craft is recognized, but at the same time, they are unaware as to how to monetize uh, it. Um, and uh, they are unaware how to monetize it or saying that it's not making any difference to them. Uh, how, how can we... Um, you know, sort of uh, help the weavers benefit, help clusters, um, you know, benefit from their GI tagging. Jayaji. Uh, uh, I don't find much value in GI. Right. Because uh, it's too much of, you know, pay 50,000, then you get a lawyer and then you fight a battle which you don't know how to yeah. fight. And you don't know who's copying your stuff anyway. And yeah. all our carriers whom I've talked to, because government wanted us to be part of a program and talk to them about it, they said a certificate you know, goes on the wall and that's it. We don't find any help in it. Yeah. It gives them a certain pride and prestige. They like to talk about it. Maybe later on, it might solidify into something that is valuable and workable. Yeah. At the moment, it is still very raw. And I think too, too many of these programs are dumped on people and expected to solve the problem overnight. Right, right. Um, I just so, like to add, how the GI tag going to solve? Because how can we free some sort of a development or identity for one point of time? Let's yeah. say if Chanderi is only two paddle loom and it, it wants a four paddle loom, the Chanderi is going to look a little different. So it's not GI tag. I think you need to rethink after a decade. And also what is, I can go on, like mushroom technique is from somewhere else. Yeah. The time technique, ikat is from somewhere else. The yarn is somewhere else. And then all become and then become Indian mushroom. So how can we stop? Is saying that, oh, your language cannot accept any word from any lingo. I, it's not possible. I don't know. I really don't understand. I mean, the quote, if I may just add that to that, the quota Doria was, is today, I, yeah, I believe. Yeah. It has, a, it has a GI in Rajasthan, but originally it was the Mysoria. I mean, in yeah. Jaipur, even today, among yeah. a certain generation, the Kota Doria is called the Mysoria. Yeah. It, it's believed to have come from Mysore. Yeah. Um, we was in Maheshwar, Susan, you were talking about your Maheshwar sari that you're wearing. Yeah. You know, yeah. Brought in from Mysore by Ahilya yeah. Devi. Uh, and, and, you know, so this, this problem of GI, again, is it fits within very international frameworks that often don't really apply to India. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really problematic. I want to make right. a very quick point here. So everyone okay. asks Chanderi, oh, people in Chanderi, they don't wear, the weaver themselves, they don't wear sari Chanderi, and how is that possible? No one wants to know, actually, the Chanderi sari, I think, only happened in last 150 years. There was not a sari weaving tradition only. It was only a turban or maybe a, just a piece of fabric with a very small border. Right. It reached to sari now. It is. It won't survive two hundred wash every day. Yeah. And I don't right. think people like that. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjay. So uh, you know now the questions have stayed into how to work with uh, the Dastakari Hard Samiti, and I'm getting messages about wanting internships with uh, Sanjay and you know <laughs> the rest of it. So you know I I think I should call it a day. Uh, a very very warm thank you uh, to Jayaji, Sanjay, and Mayank. I hope that you know when we scale it up into a, a real life event, bloom. Uh, you know when it really blooms into the bloom after the pandemic. I hope that we will have you on campus, uh, and you know uh, we'll have a more organic conversation rather than you know go through these you know back artificial backgrounds and you know technical glitches and whatever it is so uh, thank you so much for joining me uh, on this morning uh, jrg mayank and sanjay on behalf of uh, nearly 300 people who have tuned in and on behalf of uh, nift and uh, the campus uh, thank you so much for joining us today and i wish you a very good day